as time progressed, uh, the conditions of the airport deteriorated. And uh, there were many people we couldn't get out. Um, a number of them uh, are still in Afghanistan and, and it's become next to impossible to get people out of Afghanistan now. This war ended uh, really unlike any other war we've seen uh, because of the, the connectivity that just exists in the world right now. So the way that I was able to help uh, along with many other veterans and also journalists who had ties to Afghanistan um, was basically by crowdsourcing uh, an evacuation by helping uh, you know, arrange buses to the airport, helping coordinate with people on the ground in the airport. You know, and in one case, uh, a journalist colleague of mine who'd written a book on the Taliban and had very good contacts within the Taliban was able to negotiate passage through their checkpoints. Um, so it was really through basically being one part of a larger crowdsourced evacuation. And that's the story that I tell in the book. I mean, when you say crowdsource, it sounds like very uh, run of the mill and, you know, just kind of like keeping tabs on things. But this is nail biting, nerve wracking stuff because you're having to uh, make life, de life or death decisions or try to contact people to pull favors for you. and You're not sure if you're still in their good books. I mean, how does that make you feel to be that that lifeline between uh, desperate people? Well, I think, you know, everyone is doing what they need to do in the moment. And, uh, you know, if someone reaches out to you for help, um, you're, you know, you're, you're going to do everything you can to help them. But I think, you know, to answer your question in a broader sense, you know, psychologically, um, it pulls you back into the war. You know, this is a war that I thought I left 10 years ago. And, you know, as Kabul was falling, and there was no real method for anyone to get out. You know, there was no State Department phone number or email address you could pass along in good conscience and think that that would help someone get evacuated from Afghanistan. You know, we kind of had to create those networks ourselves. And that the result was pulling me and I think many, many American veterans um, back into the war. So you talked about the 109 people on the buses that you were trying to get through to the unnamed gate at the airport. Do you know what happened to the ones who didn't make it? Because you were able to get those 109 people through, weren't you? We were. I mean, we, you know, we had, and, you know, the, the story is the fifth act. It's really these five cases of evacuations and um, they, they ended differently. So the, the, the case of the 109, we were able to get all of them out successfully. Um, but as time progressed, uh, the conditions of the airport deteriorated and uh, there were many people we couldn't get out. Um, a number of them uh, are still in Afghanistan and, and it's become next to impossible to get people out of Afghanistan now. So you know, this isn't necessarily a story that just has a, a simple and happy ending. I'm wondering if you were shocked by the way uh, everything descended into chaos in Afghanistan, um, just even in terms of the way the American government conducted the evacuation and then the way the Afghan army and government crumbled so quickly. Um, well, you know, there were, there were many people who, uh, after President Biden announced the withdrawal in April, were, were asking about and saying you know, there needs to be some type of an evacuation to include uh, a number of, of members of Congress, um, some of whom were actually uh, my contemporaries in the Marine Corps who went on to have political careers. Um, but no, you know, no evacuation arrangements were made. So I think the, the speed with which Kabul fell um, startled many. Um, but once that happened, the, the debacle at the airport was not surprising because uh, there hadn't been any any planning to pull people out. And kind of what you saw was a a, a really unprecedented collapse. It was like nothing I had ever seen uh, in, in my lifetime. In the book, you talk uh, very disparagingly about these forever wars and also the system in America that allows them to exist. There's no kind of uh, financial oversight and, and the American people aren't really asked to make any sacrifices e either through taxes or through through a draft. Um, when you left the American military 10 years ago, did you foresee what would ultimately happen in Afghanistan? Um, I don't think I didn't I didn't necessarily foresee it, but the you know the one of the great lessons I think that we should take uh, in the United States from these wars is that these wars had a construct. And as you mentioned, the way they were constructed was they would be fought by an all volunteer military and they would be paid for through our deficits. So 
the result was that the American people were anesthetized to the cost of war. And it shouldn't be a surprise that you wind up getting a, a 20 year war. So the next time the US or really any nation goes to war, I think its citizens should be very cautious if the political leaders are trying to set up the war in a way that it will be uh, politically easy for them to go to war. Um, so I think that's a huge lesson we should take from these forever wars. I'm interested in what you make of the Taliban ruled Afghanistan now. I mean, obviously n not great, but uh, any upsides at all? I, I don't know if that's just a ridiculous question, but what do you think? No, I mean, I don't think there are any any real upsides. I, I think the one upside that maybe comes out of, you know, the 20 years that NATO was in Afghanistan is that the Taliban are currently trying to govern a population and take uh, their population back in time. But it's a population that's a young population, yeah. a population that has grown up, you know, connected to the rest of the world for 20 years. Um, and I don't think we know yet what the end game is going to be in Afghanistan, but you have an Afghan people, you know, many of whom are just not going to be resigned to live under Taliban rule. I think that's an interesting point because uh, time moves on. You have a whole new generation who were born after uh, September 11th, which defined uh, and justified to a certain extent the original invasion of uh, Afghanistan. And uh, you see when the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, kind of a similar thing where I think the, you know, Putin certainly underestimated uh, the, the will of the Ukrainian people. Um, do you see a connection uh, between uh, those two conflicts, the U.S. collapse in Afghanistan and the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Well, I think to understand either, it's pretty, you know, it's important to have them in conversation with one another. And, you know, think about kind of what a remarkable year we've lived through. Um, you know, and saw what was probably one of, you know, NATO's darkest hours since the creation of the alliance, which was, again, just this epic collapse uh, in, in Kabul. And it happened at a time when uh, it would appear now, you know, Vladimir Putin was sort of weighing his options and figuring out exactly what he was going to be doing in Ukraine. And I'm certain a part of that calculus was how strong the NATO response would be. And what he saw was a very, you know, anemic, even incompetent uh, NATO response in Afghanistan as we pulled out. But how remarkable that within a six month period, when he, six months later, when he invades Ukraine, you know, I would argue you saw probably one of NATO's most shining moments is the way the alliance held together um, to help support Ukraine and stand against Russian aggression. So it's really been a, a pretty dizzying year. Yeah. Tell me the one thing that someone who served in Afghanistan understands about the country that the rest of us still don't. Well, to be fair, I would say, you know, one of the things that, that, um, that always struck me, I served in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and when I would, you know, sp you know speak with Iraq Iraqi leaders and we would talk about the country and, you know, them supporting their government and our efforts there, you know, it's always sort of under the auspices of peace. You know, we're going to do this so that the country can, you know, nominally be at peace. And um, when you would talk to them about peace, peace was an act of memory because the country had recently been at peace. Yeah. In Afghanistan, when you would have those conversations about peace, um, it was a very different conversation because you know, the war had been going on there since 1979. You know, life, Afghan life expectancy in Afghanistan is, is, is early 60s. So for most people, there was no grown up memory of their country at peace. And so when you're having those conversations, you're not engaging with their memories. You're asking them to, do, to, to imagine. You're engaging with people's imaginations. And I think in Afghanistan, you know, we are still trying to imagine, you know, what peace can look like. 